Well, good morning, online family. I want to begin by saying, first off, happy Easter. Uh, Jesus is still alive, and there's still hope and celebration to be had. So don't let the quarantine stop you from praising Jesus today, because he is still alive today as much as he was then. So it's an exciting day. I want to begin today, before I jump into the message, by saying, on behalf of myself and Lindy, thank you so much for, uh, for the confidence and for the uh, belief in what God is doing here at Bethel, and uh, we just, we're honored to be your new pastors, and uh, we are trusting God, we are believing God, so we ask you to pray for us and uh, continue, uh, as we continue to see what God's going to do here at our church. Today, I want to start out by saying, I want to take you on a journey. I want to start uh, with a journey that began a long time ago when it comes to Easter, you see, a lot of times we'll take Easter and we'll say, well, it's all about the resurrection or the death on the cross, and we stop there. But with everything, with every idea, everything that takes place, there's always a concept, there's always a beginning. I used to have some cars back in the day that I really loved. Matter of fact, I had this, it's crazy, but I had this car, it was a Mitsubishi Eclipse, and I thought I was just the thing when I was a teenager driving around in this thing. It was a five-speed, man, I I souped the engine up a little bit, and uh, I just made it my own. Now, that car didn't start on the car lot. It started as a concept in somebody's mind a long time before it was made. When you, come, when you think about Easter, you have to think in those terms as well. The cross and the, the resurrection is something we're celebrating right now, and we're thanking Jesus for dying on the cross and for, for walking out of that tomb. But where did the concept begin? Where did the thought begin? You see, the thought of Easter, the idea of Easter actually started in a garden. And a lot of you right now are going, okay, Garden of Gethsemane. That's where Jesus actually knelt down, prayed, and surrendered his will to the Father. But I'm not talking about that garden. You see, it started in a garden way back before then. It was a garden that was beautiful. It was a garden full of exotic animals, amazing animals. It was a place where uh, the food was amazing, where they could do whatever. And they were created, human beings were created to live forever in this garden. There was nothing more beautiful than this first garden ever created. It was called the Garden of Eden. And see, we're going to start right there because I want you to catch the concept of where Easter began, where the idea of Easter started. So if you would, turn, with your, turn to your Bibles today with me to Genesis chapter 3, beginning with verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, And also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. This is the key right here. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So I want to give you a quick recap of where we're at right now. Satan rebelled. If you know the story, he rebelled. He was kicked out of heaven and he was thrown to the earth. He wasn't thrown to hell. He was thrown to the earth. And while he was on the earth, he possessed the, 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 the being of a serpent. He took the serpent. He went as the serpent to the man and the woman, Adam and Eve. He deceived them. They fell into the temptation that they had, and now we're here. We're right here where we're at now. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. They were now able to see their sin and experience sin for the first time ever. This was the first time ever that sin had walked into the earth. There's something within each of us, each person here, each person listening to the sound of my voice, that compels us to wreak havoc and destruction, and it's called evil. It's within us because of this falling of Adam and Eve that leads to the falling of all humanity. We were born with this evil desire inside of us, this thing called the sin nature. We were born that way. We were born with it. It's within us. We're born with a desire to rebel. With this inborn desire comes two things I want to show you. It's two different effects. The first one is a direct effect. A direct effect, this is what directly affects us or someone around us. For example, if I steal something, I've created an injustice to myself. I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to get uh, jail time, whatever it may be. I'm going to get in trouble. 
Then there's an indirect effect. This is all part of sin. There's an indirect effect to sin. This is what indirectly affects the environment around us, namely relationships. This creates relational vandalism that needs to be made right. For example, if I stole a car and the person I stole the car from now couldn't go to work, so he got fired, I indirectly vandalized another person's life through my sin. You see, sin has a ripple effect. It may affect us, but see, this indirect and this direct, they go together. Because we may directly do something that's going to get us in trouble, but what we do will affect other people in turn. It makes us think sometimes, why don't God just rid the world of evil? Well, if he did that, it's a great idea, but what if he did that? If he did that, he would have to wipe all humanity off the planet. Because we're all evil within us. We're born like that. So a plan was to put into place. To deal with the evil in the world without destroying humanity. But how was that, well, how was that possible? After the fall of man that brought sin into the world, a plan was made to bring atonement or a separation from sin, and this was done through animal sacrifice. You've probably all heard the story of how they would take an animal and they would take it to the priest, and the priest would kill the animal on the altar as an atonement, as a separation of their sin. They would do this once a year. That was the plan. That was the idea of how to not necessarily rid sin, but to bring an atonement, a forgiveness, a disconnect between man and sin. That was how God planned it. It began to work. Animals were symbolically dying in my place. This was God's grace and injustice at work. This brought atonement. It covered our debt through the shedding of the blood of an animal. Remember the relational vandalism that I mentioned? The priest would wash away the vandalism by sprinkling the blood over different parts of the temple. Why? Because the blood represented life, and that purification that was needed came through the life-giving blood of that animal. So that was the, that was the, the concocted plan, the, the plan that brought about an atonement. Sounds like there was a plan in place, but that plan would soon be overtaken by the sin and the evil of mankind once again. I want you to listen to this. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 13. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. Sacrifices became ritualistic, and the prophet Isaiah called it out. They became ritualistic. What does that mean? What does it mean to become meaningless? Think about this. When the churches are open and the people come to church, how often do we come to church because we feel an obligation as a Christian by name to go to church? I want to go because that way I feel better about myself throughout the week or throughout the weeks ahead. There are a lot of people that just go to church one time a year, and that's on Easter or twice a year, Easter and Christmas. And you know what? I'm so thankful for you. If you're watching us today and that's you, I'm so thankful that you're here. But we can't get ritualistic in attendance. We can't get ritualistic in the things we do for God. It has to be about a relationship. It has to be about an atonement, a separation from sin, a forgiveness. Sacrifices became meaningless, so Isaiah decides that it was not only time to call them out, but later on, you'll see in the book of Isaiah, he tells what's to come. Because there's something incredible that's coming. And I want you to see what that is. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6 and 7. Listen to this. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and he was esteemed not. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Animal sacrifices were stopped because Jesus became that perfect sacrifice. He carried the weight of the sin of the world on his shoulders all the way to the cross. 
Jesus' death offered purification and washed away the vandalism within us. Jesus' death, unlike the animal sacrifice, was not final. He rose from the dead. That's what Easter is. It's a celebration of the risen Savior. He is and was the sacrifice that broke the power of death and evil over our lives. That day, the day in which the sacrifice was made, was a day in which would change humanity forever. I want you to listen to this for a moment. I want to paint a picture for you. You've all heard this picture before, but sometimes we need it. We need to remember it. They took this man who did nothing. Did nothing wrong. They took him. They beat him severely. Matter of fact, some places in the Bible allude to his intestines hanging out. Because the beating was so severe. Once they did that, once they had their fun with that, they slammed a crown of thorns on his head. They put a robe on him. They began to bow to him. They put a staff in his hand and began to mock him. They put nails in his hands and in his feet. Spit on him. Pulled his beard out. In the midst of all this, he said nothing. He said nothing. Why would he do that? Why wouldn't he do that? He could have called down a legion of angels to pull him away from that situation. But I'm going to tell you right now, no God can be held to a tree with nails. So there had to be something more. There had to be something different that Jesus knew about. And that was simply this. I have to do this to save humanity. An animal sacrifice is no longer, no longer working. Sin is in the world. Humanity is doomed. There has to be someone that will step up. And God said, my son, I'm going to send him. He is pure. He is spotless. And I'm going to send him to the slaughter on behalf of all these people that I'm so desperately in love with. You have to understand, the only way you could send your child to do this for somebody else is to be desperately in love with those people. He is desperately in love with us. That's why he sent his son. That's why Jesus, Jesus, the son of God, that's why he laid his life down because he as well is desperately in love with us. After a few days, they take him, a few hours, they take him off that cross and they place him in what the Bible says is Joseph's tomb. It was a borrowed tomb. I've said this time and time again, but you don't, put, you don't put something in something borrowed if you don't intend to give it back. And I'm going to tell you today, Jesus knew, I'm going to take this borrowed tomb because my intention is to give it right back to you. So I'm not going to need it forever. It didn't end in death. See, animal sacrifice would, would die. And then a year later, I'd have to do it all over again. Every year, I'd have to do it all over again. But the great thing about Jesus is he laid his life down as the perfect sacrifice, and now we don't have to do it again. We don't have to lay something down. We don't have to sacrifice something every year. Now we look at the ultimate sacrifice, and we walk into his presence at any moment, at any second of any day. That's what Jesus gave to us through his death on the cross. But it didn't end there. Something different about Jesus. See, something happened. Something happened. You know, yesterday on Saturday, it was known as Silent Saturday. It's the day between the death of Jesus and the resurrection Silent Saturday is a day when the world at that time saw God as being silent. Nothing. They put Jesus in a tomb and nothing. But what they didn't realize, because see, they were afraid, kind of like we may be today, with all that's going on around us. They were anxious. They were in despair. They were desperate. 
Jesus, you said that you were going to rise from the dead. What happened? Why? Jesus is the king of the Jews. He is the Messiah. How can he be dead? Can you imagine what's going on through their minds when they're wandering around going, how in the world can he possibly be dead? Silence. Just because God is silent doesn't mean that he's not near. I want you to understand that. Somebody needs to hear that right now because you're in terrified fear right now. You're terrified of what's going on. You just about won't leave your house, not because of the quarantine, but because of the fear that has gripped you so much. I'm going to tell you right now, just because God may seem silent doesn't mean that he's not near you. God was near this whole time and he was working out this plan because he was about to blow people's minds because the, the third day was coming. Sunday was coming, and Jesus was going to walk out of that tomb and blow minds. Listen to this. Mark chapter 16, beginning with verse 2. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Look at it. I was, I was doing this little study, this little Bible study the other day, just by myself, just kind of reading some things and I noticed something really cool. In John, in the book of John, it talks about this very story. And it says that when they walked in there, the, the, the grave clothes were laid off to the side. But the napkin, listen to this, the napkin that covered his face, because what they would do is they would wrap their face. If you look at the account of Lazarus being raised from the dead, when he walked out of the tomb, Jesus said, unwrap his face. They would wrap it. So when they laid Jesus down, they put a napkin or a cloth over his face. In Jewish tradition, in Jewish customs, the man of the house, the master, if you will, when he would finish eating, he would get up and he would either roll his napkin, which meant that he's done, you can take my plate now, or he would fold it and he would lay it there, meaning I'm coming back. Now, if you read that account in the book of John, and you'll see what, that, what it says, it says, the napkin was folded. It was folded on the gravestone. It was folded on the place where they laid Jesus. Now, that to me tells me this. Jesus was smart enough to know, well, you know what? In this custom, they're going to know what this means. When it's folded, it means I'm coming back. It means I'm the master, I'm the king, I've stepped out of this tomb, and I'm coming back. So don't count me out just yet. The resurrection means something for us today. I want to show you what it means for us today. I want to show you three things. The first thing is this. The resurrection is victory over sin. There's nothing material that can satisfy the human soul. Not our intellect, not our politics, or whatever else strokes our egos. It's not going to satisfy us. Those things only give us temporary happiness. Sin will openly or privately Destroy your life. The resurrection of Jesus destroyed the sin in the grave and set humanity free who were in bondage to sin and death and is still able to do that today. What does the resurrection mean for us today? It still means freedom today. It still means freedom. On a cross, Jesus took on the sin of you and I. By walking out of that tomb, he destroyed the power of of sin and death. The second thing the resurrection means for us, it means that it's a gift of eternal life. The, the, the resurrection of Jesus gave humanity eternal life. 1 Corinthians, check this out, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is what it says in verse 16 and 17. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. If this did not happen, you will forever be in your sins. 
If God did not come up with this plan to say, I'm going to give the perfect sacrifice for all of humanity that will take the first time, then we're still all in our sins. One of the greatest benefits of the resurrection of Jesus is to know that someday, despite the suffering and anguish in this world, we shall resurrect after death and live with Jesus forever in that glorious kingdom that awaits every believer. When I say believer, I mean those with relationship, those who know him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, remember what happened in the garden, the opening concept of what we celebrate today. Even so, in Christ, all shall be made alive. Third and final thing I want to show you this morning. The resurrection brings daily victory through resurrection power. The lamb or goat or bull that was sacrificed once a year was not sacrificed by a person, but only by a priest. Today, because of what Jesus did, we have been granted access to him every day second of every day each and every day we are able to walk in the power of the resurrection in Romans 8 you see Paul say that the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of us the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of me the same power that woke him up from that deathly sleep and he stood up and walked out of that tomb, the same power that gave him the ability to do that lives inside of me when I'm facing fear, when I'm facing anxiety, when I'm facing uncertainty. That same power for death to, for Jesus to overcome death lives inside of me to overcome the things that come against me in this world. The idea of Easter began in a garden where sin entered humanity. Easter is all about the resurrection that was needed in order to cover the sins of humanity. You know, I don't think it was an accident that when you look at that account of Jesus raising from the dead and when he walked out, he goes, he goes to people. First person he goes to, Mary Magdalene. I think about that and I think, you know, if you look at Mary Magdalene, she had seven demons that Jesus cast out. She was a disaster. But Jesus set her free. And to show his resurrection power, she's the first person he goes to. He didn't go to the greatest king in the, in the, in the city. He didn't go to the most powerful person, businessman in the city. He went to that one person that's seen his power in her life. Some of you today, you need to see the power of the resurrection in your own life. You're lost. You're you're wandering aimlessly because you're looking for God. But see, you're looking for God in the wrong places. You're saying, God, why why don't this virus go away so I can get back to normal? Why would God do this? Listen, God didn't necessarily, I'm going to say this right now, God didn't necessarily place this virus here, but I'm going to tell you, he's going to use it for his glory. Nothing goes to waste. Your pain doesn't go to waste. The things in the world that are going on that we can't control doesn't go to waste. He's going to use it. I'm believing, I'm believing so much that there's there's an awakening coming. That people are going to come and there's gonna, we're going to see a harvest of souls come. People coming to know Jesus. And it starts right now. What if it started on Resurrection Sunday? What if your resurrection began today? What if you came out of your sin today? What if you experienced the same power that raised Christ from the dead, that lives inside of us, those of us that know Jesus? If you're here this morning and you're, you're tuning in today and you say, I don't have a relationship with God. I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I don't know him as my Savior. What better day than Resurrection Sunday to invite the one who said, I am so passionately in love with humanity that I'm going to lay my life down for them. 
what better day? This is what I want to do. I want to pray with you. If you're here this morning and you say, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, I'm going to simply lead you in a prayer. Obviously, it's a little different because we're not in person. But you can do it right from your home. Listen, I, I gave my life to Jesus behind the steering wheel of my car. I wasn't in a church. I was on the side of the road in a little town in Alabama when I said, Jesus, I need you in my life. You don't have to be in a fancy building. You can do it right there from your home, from your living room, from your kitchen, wherever you're watching from. So if that's you today and you say, I need to meet Jesus, I need to know him today, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I come before you today in need of a Savior. Today, Jesus, I give you my life and I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer this morning, the Bible says anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. You're brand new just like that. There was no animal involved. There was no hoping you, hoping this takes. It's none of that. Jesus heard you. God heard you. And he said, I sent my son for you. For the very people who said that prayer this morning, Jesus was sent for you. And this is what I want you to do. If you said that prayer, I want you to text the word believe to the number on the screen. Now listen, this is how we have to do this because we're not in person with you. But I promise you this, you text that number and you text that, that number and put the word believe down. We will get in touch with you. We will help you and walk through this journey with you. Even if it's over the phone, we're going to do it. We're going to be here for you. So if you said that prayer this morning, I want you to, to text the word believe to the number on the screen. We're going to leave that number up for just a little while. You know, it's, amaz it's an amazing thing when you come to know Jesus. Your life goes from black and white to color in an instant. God begins to work in your life, begins to change your heart. And you'll see a difference in yourself if you truly go after him. First thing I want you to do is start reading your Bible. It sounds so elementary, but it's the foundation of what you're, what you're needing to do now. Start reading your Bible. Begin with the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read those books, and when you're done, read it again. Because here's the deal. You have to find out, and you have to get to know the person who fell in love with you and gave his life for you. You need to know who they are. You need to know who Jesus is. Right now, you can't say, I love you, Jesus, but you can say, thank you, Jesus, because you saved me and you love me enough to meet me right where I'm at. You should begin to pray. Spend five minutes a day, ten minutes a day, just talking to Jesus, talking to God. Like I said, you text the word believe to that number. We're going to get in touch with you, and we're going to help you in this journey. So if you wouldn't mind as we close Easter Sunday, as we close it, I want to pray a prayer of blessing over you. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray right now for every person, every person that's joining us today. Lord, I pray, God, that your presence will wrap them. God, that your presence will fill their home, that peace and comfort will follow them every day of their life. And God, for those who said that prayer this morning, for those who said yes to Jesus today, Lord, I pray for blessing. I pray, God, that you will reveal yourself to them in ways that they can never imagine. I pray, God, that they will understand that you are there, that you haven't left them. God, that you are right there with them through this. And Lord, I ask you right now, in Jesus' name, to go before and go behind every person that's with us today. 
Amen. Thank you for joining us today. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to stay put, grab your kids, grab your family together, because we have an incredible Easter kids ministry uh, service coming for you right now. God bless you.